Hey, it's time for voiceover potty shop. Tech talk number, ouch, 35. Oh, the arthritis in this knuckle. How does that work exactly? 35? Okay. 35. This is the 35th tech talk. And we got lots of stuff to talk about tonight, too. You've got some great stuff in your tech update, like... Too much stuff, actually. <laughs> I've been finding more and more stories. I'm just watching um, this stuff pile up in here. Oh, uh, yeah. We're going to talk about Luna, the new DAW. We're going to talk about um, the new version of Levelator. What okay. the heck is Levelator? <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, the new Hackintosh computer that's available, Audacity Woes, and probably more. All right. More stuff than you can possibly handle. Hopefully your brains won't explode, but at least you're going to get some good information here. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars. A Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Hey there, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. BS. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I interesting technologically, you know, I do a lot of editing and stuff. And I have just started to develop osteoarthritis in this knuckle. Ooh. Which makes it really tough to edit. And so which one are you using? I'm using a magic this? mouse. What is this? I'm using a magic mouse. Uh but that I find, doesn't surprise me actually. Yeah. Because I had pain a couple of years ago. Yeah. I'm using this. Yeah. Until I went to this. Hmm. Well, I've got one. Yeah. I find that it hurts just as much using the pad on my laptop. Too, okay. So. But what I've done, and I'm, it's not like that right now, is I've been taping these fingers together because it's the motion sideways that hurts. Oh. So I'm doing that. But I'm finding that I'm missing every time I click on the wrong side of the mouse. It's like, why isn't this where? Oh, because I'm one finger over. It's very strange. Anyway. Well, I'll tell you, I, I got used to, I, so what I've done with the trackpad is I don't use it as, I don't click, right? Yeah. So trackpads have a click button on the bottom. Right. So when you, you press down, them. yeah, yeah, I just have tap mode and that seems to help me a little bit. I don't, I don't know if that makes a difference, but. I wonder, does the magic the mouse have that? Oh, maybe it does. Um, the magic mouse, I think you still actually have to click it to get yeah. a click. I don't think it has a tap. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't used it in a while. Hey, if you know, let us know. Anyway, yeah. we're here to talk about voice over technology, which is why you guys keep tuning in, because you want to hear George and I talk shop, because we've been talking shop for the last nine years. Well, we, you and I have been talking shop for like the last 11 or 12 years before we started doing this. And uh, we want to make sure that you guys get it right, because everybody has to have a home studio now. 
and you're getting all these edicts from the, the studios and your agents and other people saying, you have to have this and you have to have that. Although, you know, they say, you have to have a TLM-103. I'm usually telling them, you know, I have a TLM-103. I don't tell them it's sitting in a box in the closet. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's it's like... Does that mean you could buy, like, a broken one for parts on eBay for... <laughs> For, it may be. For a cheap and just say, I have one? Yeah. Is that lying? <laughs> well, it, it's it's sort of like that line from the Pink Panther. You know, Cluso's checking into a hotel, and uh, there's a dog there, and he goes, oh, does your dog bite? And the clerk says, no, my dog does not bite. And he goes, oh, good doggy. Doggy bites him. He says, I thought you said your dog does not bite. He says, not my dog. <laughs> yeah, that's so crazy. It's a classic. <laughs> it's you know, it's pretty important, and that <sighs> I, I think with equipment, it's like that as well. But if you need to learn, if you're just starting out in voiceover, or if you're an experienced voice actor, and George and I work with them all the time, who's never really done it themselves, they go into the studio, they, they get the craft service and somebody taking care of them, and the engineer, you know, moving the microphone for them and stuff, and they're, now they're like, well, now I have to do it at home. Don't panic. You got a couple of guys here that actually know how to get it done and get it done inexpensively. And a takeaway, I, I think the way you describe it is this black art that people think it is. Mm. And if people want to work with you and, and learn how to do it or have you set it up, how would they work with you, Mr. Widdham? Well, for starters, you'd head over to georgethe.tech. That's the site that has all my information on how to get a hold of me, book support with me remotely. Um, then we have processing settings I can do for you for specific kind of needs, or even just what really most everybody needs at this point is just a sound check, sending in your audio and having me take a listen and giving my thoughts about where you're coming in and making sure we get that whistle dialed in. Dan, you do whistle. Yes, which stands for what it's supposed to what it's supposed to sound like. Right. Hurt my finger doing that. And you uh, whistle on another, uh, you whistle in a different way. What's your, uh, what's your website? My website is homevoiceoverstudio.com. And you can find me over there and you can submit audio to me. Uh, $25. I will give you a very thorough analysis. All you have to do is go to that homepage, homevoiceoverstudio.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, where you come across my specimen collection cup and you click on that and that will trick you to a Dropbox and follow the instructions to a T. But I also help people set up their studios, explain to them the basics of how you build a home studio and really what's required. And it's not usually as you know deep and dark as some people think it is. It really is mostly physical stuff. And I, and I teach that. So uh, feel free to uh, give either of us a buzz or an email or, or click on the links that say contact us and we will get back to you and uh, we'll set something up. Anyway, boy, a lot of stuff in your tech stuff. You know, I was like looking at this earlier today. I'm like, well, there's nothing, there was there nothing yet. there earlier. Yeah. And I'm during the show. I'm like, oh, okay. Looks like you're coming up with a lot of stuff. What is in your tech update this week? Well, it's uh, the first thing that came to mind was I saw a post maybe last week or a week before from actually one of our sponsors, David H. Lawrence, the 17th. And, uh, you know, he develops this thing called Audio Cupcake, which is he developed Audio Cupcake as an answer to the fact that this other tool called Levelator was not being maintained and up to date. Um, what the heck is Levelator? What is Levelator? So, yes. So Levelator is, I call it an audio black box. So classically, a black box is something where something goes in, something happens inside the box, and then something comes out the other side. Maybe it's from magicians, you know? And um, so Levelator is an audio black box. What happens is you literally can drag an audio file into the, literally a drop box, not like a box that you drag and drop files into. And it pumps out a new file on the other side that's been modified. How so exactly is dependent on the software's own algorithms. It does all kinds of things that are, that are uh, un, out of your control. It's completely 100% automatic. And so it does leveling, taking quieter sections of your audio, of your track and making it louder. Um, 
it does uh, compression to control dynamic range. I think it also does expansion, noise reduction. I, I, it does a lot of different stuff. Um, and so I know people are using it for audiobook mastering. And for me, it's kind of like, it's too automatic. Like as an engineer, I want a tool that I can hone or adjust, especially tonally. Um, one thing that an automatic tool can't do, while it might be able to give you a file with a consistent level or an RMS level, it cannot make judgments of EQ and adjusting tone. So it's definitely not an all, uh, an all fixing tool. But if you want to try it now on a Catalina uh, Mac, so any modern new Mac with Catalina, well, believe it or not, they, this, this software came out of the ashes, rose from the ashes from its 2020, 2012 version. And they have a new version. If you go to your app store on the Mac, it's in there. It's called the Level Later. So you can install it now and try it out. Give it a shot. Try it out. See what it does to your audio files. I recommend trying this on maybe a bunch of e-learning files or on audiobook files and seeing what does it do to the audio? Does it sound better but just louder? Does it sound all over the, over the map? What is it doing to your audio? Um, it's something to experiment with. I'm not going to endorse it in any way um, because I have no idea what it's going to do to your audio file. Because everybody's I don't voice know what, is different. Yeah, I have no idea what it's going to do. I'll tell you really quick what the guys that developed this for. It said, it says, when we developed the IT conversations component-based show assembly system, some kind of automation system for putting together content online, they realized that all the components had to be of the same loudness, all the audio files, or the results would sound awful. <laughs> yes, they would. And they limped along for many months using a bunch of different plugins and stuff, but the results weren't satisfactory. And so some of the post-production and audio engineers um, and uh, came together. One guy named Bruce Sharp offered to write a standalone software RMS normalization utility, and they've been using it a part of their production system, the CNU up, CN Uploader, since 2005. So this thing was not in any way developed for audiobooks specifically, or really any genre of voiceover specifically, but was a tool they developed for their service. They just decided, oh, let's let everybody try it out. And anyway, many years later, it still exists, 15 years later, and they made a new version. So give it a try, see what you think, and see if it's helpful or if it just makes ma uh, you know a mess out of your audio. Um, All right. Next up, Audacity, the free DAW software that I love to hate. <laughs> and honestly, sometimes I just hate to love it. Um, what does that mean? So Audacity is it's free, and that obviously makes it so pervasive. I also saw that it's been around for over 20 years. It's had its 20th anniversary which is remarkable. Um, and so it's constantly evolving. And unfortunately, in those evolving, when it evolves and when it does update, um, they just tend to sometimes arbitrarily change the names of certain features, where they're located, where the files are stored, et cetera. Now, if you're just a typical user of Audacity and you just record, edit your files, maybe normalize and send the file off, it may not affect you, but however, if you do take, make use of the macros function, um, things can get a little bit messy sometimes when you do a new or upgrade to a new version of Audacity. Why sometimes would, those macros- Why would someone use a macro? What are those for? Oh yeah, macro. So a macro is, is the ability to sort of program and automate your Audacity software to do certain tasks for you. And actually it's become far more powerful than it used to be. Um, it used to be called Chains and you could just load in uh, normalize, compress two to one, normalize EQ level, uh, master or whatever you call it, limiting, boom, whatever. Put all that into a chain and it would just do it. Um, macro adds a lot more features. Um, you can add far, far more options to a macro. A lot more different tasks um, can be added as a macro. So it's a bit more, there's even more automation now that you can do. And if it's set up right, I gotta say, I've never come up with a more elegant or fast way to master an audiobook. Um, it's a bear to set it up. It's a bear to get the, uh, the, the macros and all the right plugins imported into your system. 
it's it's a pain and it's never been seems never seems to be getting easier um and that's what makes me a little bit crazy about it once it is set up it can be pretty brilliant there's even a plugin if you know where to find it called acx check and after it does all the processing it'll spit up a window saying your rms is in the right range and your noise floor is acceptable it, it's it's pretty cool but boy setting it up is a pain um so it's just it's a little bit of a rant and it's free software but i'm telling you Sometimes free software costs you in other ways, like hiring me or one of my tech guys. <laughs> Actually, Sue's son, Hat, mm -hmm. has spent a considerable amount of time, way beyond what you would think would be normal, to help one of my clients set up uh, getting a macro to work yeah. that I created for her. And it's just, it's a bummer that it's so hard to set up. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I've been teaching people Audacity, you know, last couple of weeks because people are like, yeah. you know, we're setting up studios. And of sure. course, you get the updated version that now works with Catalina, and they right. changed a bunch of stuff. It's like changed a bunch of stuff as you're trying Maybe to teach. Broke a couple things. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh well, it used to be here, and now it's right. Don't you feel here. dumb when that happens? <laughs> like, as long as you're doing it too. So, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I feel like I, I'm like this person's paying me to be the expert, and I'm going, let me Google that. Uh, let me go to the Facebook group for Audacity. Exactly. Which, I frequent a lot. I'm the guy posting questions like, what the heck happened to this feature? <laughs> um, so anyway, Audacity, beware. It's just, it's free software. It changes at a whim and uh, support is just done by committee. So good luck with that. All right. Um, another completely different end of the spectrum in terms of DAWs, but strangely also free is Luna. Um, Luna is a new multi-track recording software from Universal Audio. Now it's free with a big ass asterisk. <laughs> that is, it's free if you own a Universal Audio Apollo or any one of it, the Apollo series. Um, so it's free-ish, um, but you have to use it with their hardware. So what it is, is basically bakes in the ability to make your audio sound like it's passing through a classic Neve mixing console and then being recorded to or mastered to a, an Aphex uh, or Atari tape machine from the 70s or something. Which has and the, very little to do with voiceover, by the way. Uh, that is for sure. <laughs> very little to do with voiceover. I, I brought this up tonight only because on Facebook, I saw the first uh, VO Tech Talk post about this. Somebody saying, I'm using Luna to record and edit my voiceover and something, something, something's happening. And it sounds like this and it's all funky, blah, blah, blah. And my comment was, Luna for voiceover editing? Who is using that? Nobody I know. <laughs> so I guess the point is, is like, if you, if you have an Apollo, go ahead and install it. Go ahead and play around with it. I just frankly haven't had time to really give it any effort. But those that need tools like this because they're producers are finding it to be pretty awesome. As a voice actor, holy cow. It's, it's really just another over-the-top multi-track DAW tool like Pro Tools. Don't go there. You really don't need. So I'm not saying go get it yet. And uh, unless you're an early adopter slash producer with an Apollo, then give it a try. All right, next thing, Hackintoshes. Dan, have you ever had a Hackintosh? I haven't, but I remember our experience with one. We actually did produce the show <laughs> with a Hackintosh for, a very for short some time, time until it started <laughs> crashing during the show. So what a Hackintosh is for those who are going, what the hell is a Hackintosh? It's a, it's a, so Mac systems, if you want to run Mac OS, you have to normally have an Apple computer. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. But one of the reasons is because it literally is the, 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 the rule set by Apple says you have to own an Apple computer to legally run Mac OS. But many years now, there's been hackers that have come up with ways to run Mac OS on non-Apple hardware. And, you know, I've known people with varying degrees of success using it, but really, honestly, everybody I know that's used it has eventually pretty much stopped um, because the long-term, the longevity and the stability over time, it is, it is a, it is a crapshoot uh, as to whether it's going to run from, from month to month, from update to update. There's so many things that can go wrong. But this company called Open Core, they decided we'll be the next ones to make Hackintoshes and commercially sell them. 
which is kind of mind boggling. I mean, that's like selling, it's basically you're selling something illegal ish, very much in the gray area of, of, of legal in terms of software licenses. And here's the reason <laughs> the problem is the Apple end user license agreement or EULA, that thing that you see when you put install software that you immediately say, yeah, I read it. And it's about 78 pages long. It says, give us your firstborn. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> it says, this is a, uh, this is a really important document. Everybody skips to the end clicks agree. And it says the software, including the boot ROM code, which is what allows a, a Mac to run Mac OS to run on a Mac, um, the documentation, the fonts, accompanying the license, whether it's on disk, read in the memory of the computer, or in any other media or in any other form, uh, collectively Apple software, uh, are licensed and not sold to you by Apple. So you don't own Mac OS. Um, and it's for use only under the terms of this license and Apple reserves all rights not express, expressly granted to you. In other words, if you go buying a computer called the Open Core Computer, and it's running Mac OS, they have every right to make it not work. Apple, meaning they, um, to make it not work. So don't go buy one of these things. <laughs> I mean, okay, it'll probably run Windows great, and it's probably a cool looking computer that will run Windows fine. So if you're buying it knowing that that might be the case after a couple of months that you might be stuck just running Windows, be my guest. But anyway, I just thought that was really bizarre and interesting to see that somebody is trying to commercially sell Hackintoshes. Anyways, yeah. that's our, it for our, my our, new tech updates. Yeah, our experiences with those were, were kind of so-so. So anyway, I thought I'd, you know, let's get back to the physical world. Uh, physical world. As opposed to the, you know, the technological world. Because, you know, as many of you know, when I, when I teach, my whole thing is everything is physical. Uh, and, you know, we had Dave Fenoy on last week who was totally agreeing with us. You know, you can have the greatest microphone in the world, but if your room sucks, it's going to, you know, that great microphone is going to prove that your room isn't very good. That's right. Uh, but one of the things, and it's controversial, because uh, I have my own opinions on it. Uh, I ran in, I had a, a run in with my agent who's also a prominent voice actor and, uh, and, and someone who is not afraid to express his opinion on YouTube and Twitter and stuff like that. But he said there was some guy on, you know, you know, on Facebook that was saying, you don't need a pop screen when you're, you know, when you're doing voiceover, some guy, some guy. And I know I've been caught saying that. A million times. Right. <laughs> don't mention any names, but it was something that I've been well known for saying, you don't really need a pop screen. Right. Uh, and so I immediately, you know, sort of got on email. I'm like, you know, it's nothing better than your agent, you know, getting on Twitter and calling you several names that I will not mention on here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wish you wouldn't do that. And he goes, oh, man, cool your jets. If I was talking about you, I would have said I was talking about some walrus-faced doofus. And then it would have been totally, and then you would have okay. understood that I was talking about you. <laughs> now we know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. So, but anyway, so I, here I have a pop screen. Now, those of us that, you know, came out of radio, we didn't have a pop screen. It was never a pop screen radio. It was, you know, it was an R, you know, a uh, an RE twenty or a, a Sennheiser. What is that? A a four seventeen or four twenty one? Four twenty one, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you you talk right into it like that, and you know, it, there was no reason that you would get any any pops or anything because they had process. Yeah. The pro yeah. yeah the processing would take care of it. So we see a lot of pictures with people doing voiceover because if you type in voiceover and you, you know, well, it's got some voiceover images, you see people, headphones, microphone, pop screen. Um, I've come to the conclusion that these things are not what people think they're for. Uh, and I think you probably agree with me, George. It's, you know, this, it's not so much a pop screen as it is a spit guard. And as I explained to everybody, it's to prevent Celine Dion from spitting on a $10,000 telefunken microphone. Does it really work? Some people say, oh yeah, it absolutely works. I find that with mic technique, if you talk directly into the diaphragm, which you know is not how we naturally talk to people. 
I mean, I, and we don't talk right into your ear. <laughs> no, we don't talk half an inch from your eardrum. You know, I say keep your mic at ear level because that's how people naturally hear you. It's you know, it's how everybody's ears hear. So why not have the microphone have the same perception as someone that you're talking to, since voiceover is an intimate one-to-one conversation, not talking to thousand people, thousands of people out in the Hollywood Bowl at once. Um, but people think that they need to have this pop screen because if you do talk directly into the diaphragm and go, Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers, you're going oh, to yeah. get what we get, plosives. Those are plosives, baby. Right. Now, some people will say, and I won't mention any names, um, well, you use a pop screen. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Does it really help? A little bit. A I would say bit. 50%. Yeah. But here's another, and here's Still the popping. thing. Yeah. <laughs> After working with hundreds and hundreds of people, I've come to the conclusion that this thing is why we keep getting these specs that say no announcers. Because when you put this thing in front of you, or it's there like that, suddenly it becomes this psychological object in front of you that's like, oh, now there's this barrier between me and this microphone. I have to project more in order for it to hear me. And people are I think that might be right. There's some something psychological about. Oh, it. I I definitely think there is. Especially people who have these you know these big ones with you know with nylon on them and stuff, or or it says you know the logo of the company that manufactured it. Um, if you're a singer, yeah, and you really work the mic like that, I can see where it, you you might need that you know one to protect your microphone, but also to prevent some plosives. But I find that if you've got the mic set properly and it's at eye level and you talk underneath it and your copy is down here like this, you can go, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers all day long and you will not That's get right. any plosives. So, uh, and, Something and you, you didn't natural. see, something I just did that you didn't see because you right. don't have a confidence monitor right now. As yeah. I swung my pop screen on my mic into the view of the camera. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Recognize, yeah, recognize I, the name on that pop screen? I, I do. It's I, I actually have, I have <laughs> the other one in my one drawer. Time, <laughs> we actually at one time had a branded pop screen, believe it or not. Right. But and, what's go ahead. what's unique about this one is the shape of it. So yeah. the reason the reason it has that slot in the middle and it's very small. It was very is, specific. This was developed for the Apogee mic. Right. This mic was and still is notoriously easy to pop, like ridiculously oh, easy to that pop. Very unforgiving microphone. Right. And so at the time, it just made sense that there should be a pop screen. Nobody was making it. We reached out to, we happen to know about this guy named Mike French. And I think that was, that's his name. And with the Hook Studios. And we, long, long story short, we ended up getting a small number of the main with our logo, which was really fun and cool. Yeah. I still have it. And I have it on this mic here mainly because I don't own this mic. So I want it to be pristine uh, when I send it back. I have to do a review of this mic. It's a Vanguard V4. Um, and this little pop screen is very in in innocuous, very small, takes up very little space. And so for me, it just makes sense to have that protection. It's a spit guard, right. you know, and that's really all that makes sense to me about anything like that. So those big disc ones that are on a gooseneck that always seem to sag down in front of the mic or take up space and you know i'm not a big fan that is that the harlan one this is that the this is a groove tubes is it groove tubes i know harlan's got one really similar yeah if it, it that has a good gooseneck on it looks like it looks like wherever you place it it stays yeah relatively well a lot of them are saggy uh anyway yeah i totally agree with dan absolutely 100 percent on the pop screen thing. yeah makes a much better fly swatter <laughs> right. it's got a little bit of you know recoil action to it anyway <laughs> exactly all righty well we got lots of questions that you guys have been sending in which is why we do this show and we're going to get to those right after these incredibly important messages so don't go away this is ariana ratner and you're yeah. listening to voiceover body shop vobs.tv And now a word from Harlan Hogan and VoiceOverEssentials.com. Has this ever happened to you? Embarrassing. 
The washers on these booms? Eh, they're not so great at holding up your expensive microphone. And here's the answer. The adjustable boom stop is great. Easy to attach and works like a charm. No more droopy mic. It's simple, ingenious, and infinitely adjustable. The padded non-slip pouch fits almost any size boom arm. Unique double loop webbing system for unlimited angle of the down strap. Works with tripod and solid round bases. Light gray webbing lets you mark and repeat stand settings for each performer. It's three ounces of protection for your expensive microphone with free standard shipping in the continental U.S. Hold up your mic with the ABS Adjustable Boom Stop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. All right. It's time to talk about source elements. You know, these people, they're the amazing techs that brought you source connect and a whole lot of other tools at this point. Uh, do you have a source connect license? Wait, you don't. All right. Well, that means you're not a voice actor. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, at this point, uh, Source Connect is the tool that's expected of professional voice actors that not only range, not only just the promo and the trailer and the commercials, but I'm even hearing audiobooks are being remotely produced now with Source Connect. What is this thing anyway? It's a way to record your voice remotely by another studio, another engineer, somewhere else, somewhere else on the planet. Um, and it allows them to capture the audio in extremely high quality, real time. I think of it as like broadcast quality Skype. Did I just say broadcast quality? Uh -oh. I sure did. Uh, <laughs> you know, totally clean studio quality, no processing, just the way it sounds right off the mic. So this is tool has become extremely popular, as you can imagine. Um, you don't have to go buy it right out of the gate. And that's the good thing. You can just get a demo license. Go to source-elements.com get a 15 day free trial, get it up and running. Um, if you need some help, head over to georgethetech.com slash SC, the Source Connect help page. And there's some free tutorials and information over there you should follow before you delve too deep. But get it up and running. Make sure you know what to do with it. Make sure you know you've got your system tweaked. And when that request comes along saying, do you have Source Connect? You can say, yes, I do. Activate your license and off you go. So anyway, we really appreciate the support from Source Elements. They've been helping us out, I bring this show to you guys for many years now. Tell them we sent you, and uh, we'll be right back. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. Number mm -hmm. five and uh, fascinating. You know, it's just always fun just talking with you. And it's amazing how we just keep finding new stuff to talk about. And I thought I would just pull out the least COVID friendly microphone in my pocket. <laughs> that is a Coles lip mic. Tell us about <laughs> it. It's literally designed to for the user to press this bar up to their lip as the guide for where the mic should be placed. And is this used for voiceover? Heck no. This is this is an announcer mic. This was like the classic BBC sports announcer mic that was used to announce like formula racing and things like that. And what makes it unique is, well, it's a ribbon microphone for one, and it has an incredible extreme amount of backside rejection. Um, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, on the side. Which is why it would be, which is unusual for a ribbon mic. Check it out. On the side, one, two, three, four, five, nothing. 
It's a really, really bizarre mic. But the most bizarre thing of all is you physically press it against your lip. So I couldn't think of a more non, a mic you would never use in, in voiceover, especially in a studio. I just thought I, I dug it up the other day. I was cleaning up my office and just thought I would show you guys the, the famous Coles lip microphone. <laughs> and, there, and, and what are you doing with that? This frankly belongs to a client and uh, it's a long story. Okay. But it, <laughs> it definitely belongs in somebody else's hands, uh, okay. um, but it's still here. So I'm playing with it. All right. Now, one of the things we wanted to bring up was when we were talking about pop screens is you, you asked the question, you know, do you, could you bring your own pop screen and headphone to a gig? I know I wouldn't, but. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess if you're really, you know, if you're very concerned about, uh, and th maybe this would even be true for just normal times, not even COVID times, but. Right. If you just don't like the idea of putting on that same pair of headphones that was worn by seven other people in the last three hours, um, bring your own headphones to the gig. Um, I don't think that's such a bad idea. Yeah, um, see what they say. I mean, you know, quarter inch jack, bring it with you. I mean, I can't imagine they would have a hard time with headphones. I also thought maybe a pop screen, BYO pop screen, probably not going to be something that the engineers are going to be all excited about rigging that thing up to their mic and all that stuff. I don't know about the pop screen, but you know what? In these strange times, they might be kind of open to it. Anything that would make the voice actor feel comfortable working in their studio, maybe not a bad idea. Yeah. I do know that the studios that are opening, dipping their toes in opening, such as um, Soundbox LA, uh, Tim Friedlander's studio, he's opened up. He calls it um, Mo Covo. Covo VO, no co, no co VO, no like co no contact VO. VO. That's yeah, what it is. Yeah. No co VO. Right. Um, they have a whole way of recording you to man minimize the amount of contact that you have to make with their equipment or anybody else. So they're being very, very cautious about it. They're approved to do this by the city, um, which I think is brilliant. Um, so there are studios slowly dipping their toes in the water of being back into business again if you really need to get into a studio. Yeah. See, I always liked it if I would go into a studio and there were no headphones, there was just a squawk box. And, you know, that way you don't have to wear headphones because I don't like wearing headphones anyway. I just happen to have to wear headphones because that's how we're hearing each other tonight and I can hear the director. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've always thought, you know, a squawk box makes more sense in voiceover. Now, if you're doing overdubbing with, you know, a band or something like that. Yeah. You got to wear headphones right. to do that. Right. So, uh, anyway, all right. Well, that's interesting thoughts. Interesting thoughts. Well, we got a ton of questions here. So why don't we dig into those then? Thank you for sending them in. If you've got a question for us, you can send it to us at the guys at V O B S dot TV. And you can get your question mentioned right here on our show. And let's start off with Richard. Why don't you take that George? Sure. Richard says, are there any significant pros or cons between recording at 48 kilohertz sample rate versus 44.1 kilohertz sample rate with the same bit depth of 24, 24 bits? And if a client has requested a specific sample rate when exporting a file, should that determine the recording sample rate? Great show. Many thanks. That's a, actually a good question. Techie question, but it's, it's a good one. I do not believe there is any audible difference in quality between 48 kilohertz and 44.1. So why do they both exist? Um, 48 kilohertz, for whatever reason, became the sample rate commonly used for broadcast of uh, video, of uh, television and uh, film sound. Just whatever reason, that, that sample rate worked well for their equipment and their production workflows. And at the same time, when Sony came up with a Red Book standard for CDs, Sony Philips, I guess, um, they settled, uh, settled on 44.1 kilohertz sample rate for CDs. So that's why that is still a thing. Um, they sound virtually identical. I don't know anybody that could tell the difference between them. I generally tell people just record in the same sample rate all the time. Just leave it set so you don't have to overthink it and screw with it. And then if you have a production specifically saying we want something at that point, just resample it, just convert it. 
um, and save it with the new sample rate. They're not going to know or hear the difference. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. So yeah, it's, it's a technicality. Um, if you're recording a source connect session, if you're a voice actor on source connect and also recording yourself, you do need to pay attention to that sample rate. They have to be the same, both softwares. So that's something we're going to keep, 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 a uh, keep an eye on that. But no, 44, one, 48, interchangeable as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I I've never had an issue with that, you know, and sometimes you send in the wrong one, they just convert it back the other way. They anyway, convert it. So it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Uh, question from Terrell Kennett. Uh, I filled the appropriate forms to obtain my iLock account and got my email and download for source connect. I have Wi-Fi in my house with the router upstairs, my studio downstairs, about 60 feet away, rather than string an Ethernet cord through my house, down the stairs, etc. I considered power line Ethernet adapters, as you suggested in episode 34, that which was last week. My house was built in the early 1950s, and the upstairs and downstairs are on different breaker switches. My research suggests that would be a problem. Thoughts? Advice? Thanks so much. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, these power line Ethernet adapter devices. I had some within arm's reach, but now they are not. Uh, wanna give me just a sec? They're right over here, Dan. I can pull one out. Okay, sure. Hang on. All right. Yeah. In the meantime, I'll 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 go on to Jack DeGallia's question here. He says, "I've got an audio editor who, for six weeks this uh, summer, da, da, yeah, da, 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 for six da. weeks this summer, will be off in the woods with less than stellar internet." Do you have any thoughts on file sharing apps that's suited for that situation? Smoke signals is probably the best answer for that. Um, you know, file sharing, if you don't have good internet, it, it, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. It just takes longer to upload stuff. So, you know, Google drive works great. If you're patient, you know, if things have to move really, really quickly, uh, you know, it's got to download it now, then you can't do it from the woods, um, uh, unless you've got like satellite internet or something like that. So I, I wouldn't know of any of those, but you know, you can address that too, Georgia. And you know, if the internet's not good, it's not going anywhere or it's just going to take a long time to get there. Yeah. I mean, less than stellar. I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, is it DSL, yeah. you know, with like uh -huh, 700 K upload? Yeah. It's gonna take gonna take longer if you're doing audiobooks and sending them to your to your uh, proofer as wave files. It's gonna be a bad experience. It's gonna, it's be, gonna take a long it's time. Gonna take overnight or more, I think, to do that. <laughs> okay, so uh, so uh, you got this go and thing. tell. Yeah. So just to explain real quick what these power line Ethernet adapters are. Here are some. Uh, one goes plugs into the wall by your uh, directly into the wall, as you can see. Then one of them plugs right into the wall by your router. The other one plugs into the wall by your computer. On the bottom, there's Ethernet, and that connects on one end to the router, the other end to your computer. And the wiring in the house is the connection between. So your house is the Ethernet is what happens. These have been around a long time, and they, they generally work pretty well. But they don't always work. And the reason is because they use the household wiring to make that connection. If the household wiring is screwed up, if there's not a ground or something weird like that, um, there's a chance it may not work. Um, but I understand in my, my experiments, it definitely works in, on circuits that are different breakers. Um, and for example, I'm in a, I'm in a different like house and I plug one into where the router is, which is in another physical building next to me. And these things actually worked in two different buildings. And the reason they worked on this in the different buildings, because there was one master box. Uh -huh. Everything went to one master box. And because of that, it still worked. So in your case, even if it's glass fuses or something, as, as long as both parts of the house are on the same uh, circuit box, you should, it should work. Mm -hmm. Best thing you can do is buy them on Amazon where you have a return policy, try them and see what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, they generally work on multiple circuits. They don't have to be all in the same breaker. They would certainly be a lot less useful if they had to be in the same room, <laughs> for example, to be on the same breaker. But is it as good as say a LAN? Because they, you know, the, the guys at Source Connect are suggesting it always, it, if you can have a LAN, you really should. 
is this good enough for something like Source Connect? Yeah, I mean, LAN is absolutely the best possible thing, a physical Ethernet cable from your router to your computer. That's best. Um, I would say most cases, as long as these are working, they are the next best thing because it's still a connection that's wired. Um, top speed will not be nearly as fast probably as the Ethernet. And in a lot of cases, it may not even be as fast as Wi-Fi. So that can, that's going to depend. But it's going to be it's going to be um, more consistent and stable, and that's probably where it most matters for Source Connect. So, give it a shot. Cross right. your fingers. Okay, cool. All right. Interesting question here from Marlene Goodman. This is this is this is the kind of stuff that you and I just live for. Uh, how do I learn the technical skills to record voiceovers? I wish to make a demo. Um. <laughs> Well, that's kind of like saying, I'd like to learn to drive a car. I'd like to make one first. Yes. Or, yeah. <laughs> kind of, right? I, essentially. <laughs> it's um, a weird analogy, but it's, you uh, know. Learning how to record properly takes proper training and education. George and I didn't just learn this stuff overnight. We learned it in college, in classes, one after another, radio production, and these sorts of things where we learn the basic theories behind how all this stuff does what it does and how to use it. And, you know, because it's much easier these days, because you can do it on a computer, doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy. It's easier than it was. I mean, you don't need expensive equipment and stuff like that. But it still comes down to the, it's not the equipment itself, but how you use it and understanding a bunch of concepts that you really do need to understand about the acoustics of your room, how you use the microphone properly, uh, setting proper input levels. Uh, if you really don't understand that, and you know, and you and I see this stuff all the time because people send us audio and it's like little tiny waveforms in there, and it's like uh, somebody doesn't understand the dB scale and why that meter is there and why do we use it and things along those lines. The best way to learn it is to hire somebody <laughs> who knows how to teach this. And that would be me and George. I mean, yeah, there's a ton of engineers out there that do this every day for a living and they're very good at it. Um, but not voiceover? necessarily good at teaching it and yeah. not, yeah, not necessarily for voiceover and certainly not necessarily good at teaching it as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots of courses online, books you can buy, blah, blah, blah. But if you could just book a half hour to an hour of time for us to teach you like very specific skills that you need to know, that's going to be a major, major shortcut. Now that leap to, I wish to make a demo, <laughs> that's a whole different that, story. That's so, a quantum leap. <laughs> yeah. So recording a great sounding voiceover track for an audition, that's very straightforward. You know, we, we can teach you to do that and that's appropriate. Teaching you how to produce a professional sounding commercially viable demo, on the other hand, that's something you leave to a professional right. producer. Right. It's a, it's a huge skill set that takes years to get really good at. Right. You know, and if you're just, if it's one of those things, well, I don't want to spend the money, then you're not really willing to invest in doing voiceover properly. You have to have a proper commercial demo that's produced by somebody who knows how to do it? Because if it doesn't sound right, it's, you know, you may get lost and it's going to hurt you. Yeah. You're going to get round fouled very, very quickly. Oh, they just did their own demo. Keep in mind, demos are often used mainly these days to, uh, to find an agent. Right. And trust me, if anybody knows what a demo should sound like, it's an agent. <laughs> so if it doesn't sound totally pro, it's a waste of your time. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Right. But do the agents know what makes it sound like that? <laughs> That, not necessarily. That we've They're discovered not is not necessarily the case. No, but All they right. know what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you take this question from Jeff Holman? Jeff, our chat room, chat room mod. Um, would changing the placement of pillows, boxes, and clothes in my closet recording space make my sound more tinny or less full or bassy sounding? Um, is there anything other than mic proximity that will change the base quality of recordings, making it sound thinner. Oh, um, well, yeah. Yeah, of course. 
you know, I always have the, the story of, you know, I, somebody called me, somebody whose studio I had set up and in their closet. And they called me back a couple of weeks later and they're like, suddenly it sounds different. And my immediate reaction was, well, did you take something to the cleaners? And, uh, <laughs> and he says, oh yeah, I said, you know, this is back in the Northeast. So I, I had a down jacket and I sent him, well, there you go. Down jacket's going to, if, if you've got it placed in the, in a specific place, that's going to diffuse that's an awful take lot, a of lot of sound. It really is. Right. Yeah. And that will change the, you know, the acoustical dynamics of the room. Uh, yeah. But it, as far as, you know, trying to keep, you know, the lower end, I mean, it depends on if you're talking about bass resonance uh, or, right. or, or, or uh, you know, bass reflex, you know, we're just, where we're, you could, it sounds like you're essentially under a, you know, in a tube or under a desk. Yeah. You, you've, you've got to, you've got to keep it consistent and in using yeah. mic proximity is not necessarily the best way to make you have a deeper voice because that's dishonest because Nobody hears you like this. You know, there's always guys you hear on the radio and then you meet effect. him. Right. You yeah. meet him in person. And they're like, well, you don't sound anything like you do on the radio. Well, that's because I don't talk an inch, you know, from your eardrum. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can, you certainly can control the low end of your mic's pickup by doing working proximity. But, um, yeah, if you were to, uh, all of a sudden add a bunch more clothing or big, thick, dense products, boxes of winter clothes got, I don't know, whatever. If you added a bunch of that stuff to the closet, the low end or the base reflects sound of that closet is going to get reduced. So it would then certainly sound less rich, full bass heavy. So yeah, that, that makes sense to me. So that could, that would definitely happen. Yeah. We keep a consistent space and consistent mic technique, you know, and, and you know, your sound and, and if, if it changes, it becomes tinny. It may not, it may be, you know, you know, it could be, could be, you're, you're talking in the wrong side of the mic thing, but you know, that happens way too often. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Why, why does I that mean, so if you, if you use a clothing closet, walk-in closet, whatever, as your voiceover booth and you decide one day or your spouse decides one day, it's time to donate all those suits <laughs> from the, from the seventies, uh, beware. You've just changed the, dramatically changed the sound of your voiceover booth so be careful about yeah. that. yeah interesting now the, the next question we have from Stephen hack which was actually intended for dave finoy last week but i oh, okay. I, I saved it and i said well, let's move this into tech talk because you know this is this is one of those things i talk about uh it says when we're being our own engineer for at-home auditions do you have any advice for how to handle scripts that require yelling or shouting for example the script says Talking, 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 then scream. Not regarding the acting, <laughs> but handling the recording and the levels. This is oh, man. This this is actually pretty basic. You you go first on this one because I've got I've got my thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, uh, my I, I I think maybe we differ on this, which I we'll see. But I my thing is set the gain for the loudest thing you're going to possibly record, and that's where the gain should be. So you set it, you know, if you know, you check your script, you know, you're going to be screaming, then you've got to test record, see where you're coming in on levels. Are you still clipping? Turn it down, check it again, do it a couple of times until you can get a clean track with no distortion and clipping. Is the rest of the audio on the track going to be super low? Uh, yeah, it's going to be super low, but that's, you know, nowadays we have equipment that can handle that dynamic range especially with 24 bit recording, it can capture and properly store that huge dynamic range. So I don't think it's as big of a concern. If you're really, really worried about it, you could break your script up and have all the loud stuff that you record and then record all the, all the other stuff. I think that's really cumbersome. Um, and I'm not sure I would recommend that, but Dan, I'm not a voice actor at the end of the day. Well, that's you true. are. So how have you handled this in your, day-to-day -day recording. Well, the way things. I teach this and the way I handle it, I, I, I provide two options. You know, when you're in a studio and you're, and you're yelling, there's going to be an engineer. Like you are controlling the audio, despite the fact that you're, you know, 10 miles from here, uh, you you can control the level. So if I say, George, I'm going to shout right now, you're, you can, yeah, if it down. was a scripted thing, the engineer, I can guarantee 
has the script, right? You but, know, and they're kind of keeping an eye on what's going on, right? But Stephen is asking here, uh, self recording, self recording. <laughs> so yeah. there, there's two techniques that I, uh, you know, and you mentioned one. One was have two level settings, you know, one for yelling, and one for normal conversation. And yeah. if it, you know, and and I would actually record the soft stuff first. And mm -hmm. the louder stuff second, because if you record the louder stuff first, it may affect your voice for when you're trying to do the quieter stuff. It's, well, good point. Yeah. So uh, it's it's an interesting point. Or the other, th you know, and then, you know, so you, you have a level set for regular conversation. And then for shouting, you turn it down. And then Two just, level settings is very easy to reproduce, right? You can even grease pencil a little I, mark i would you know? I, heck i just use your sharpie it's my my yeah. interface you know yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is and, and we talked about this with pat fraley i think a couple weeks ago is when you yell even for a video game you don't yell into people's ears unless you really want to rupture their eardrum so you can learn the proximity and yell over here because if you're farther away from the mic it's going to sound more natural because it sounds like someone yelling at you, unless it, you know, it was your father yelling at you, like, you know, right in your ear. Um, but you know, it's a matter of microphone technique and you can, you can turn away and you can, you can certainly learn. And the guys that are the big pros at this, who work the animation studios and do the, you know, the big video games like, like Dave Fenoy does, they know how to play with the mic. And there's an engineer there. But if you're doing it at home, learn the different proximity and how far away from the mic you have to get to be able to talk louder and not overmodulate if you're going to keep your levels the same. Yeah, just listen to it back, you know, experiment. You're going to have to find what works best for your scenario because if your um, booth closet setup, or whatever you're recording in, sounds really bad when you're far away from the mic, let's say it sounds super hollow and phasey and weird right that may not work so well so you may have to try different techniques because that technique can work awesome in a good studio a bigger space better acoustics i think that that technique is completely works awesome it's yeah. that totally valid so you have to experiment with uh, your studio see what works best right and, and of course the louder you talk the more the acoustics of the room come into play. That's the other thing that people don't get. It's like, well, you're projecting too much, and that's why we hear you bouncing off the walls. Make it a more intimate one-to-one -one conversation, and the acoustics of the room become less prominent. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. One last question. I'm going to let you handle this because every time, I one. every time I see someone talk about the sphere, like, suddenly they're going to be this great voice actor because they got this microphone. It's like, yeah, okay. Not that the sphere is real expensive, but go for it. It's on the, I'd say it's in the uh, upper mid-range price range. Yeah. It's, it's not cheap. Um, Scott Chambers, actually. We know Scott. He's he's actually been recording voice acting for a long time. Scooter, he's a voice all right. actor himself. Um, I'm interested in the Townsend L22 Sphere, or maybe they call it the Sphere L22. I'm not sure. Uh, studio microphone. Um Will it run on the Apollo Arrow, or is that asking too much from that interface? Um, as far as I know, Scott, I've never tested it personally with the Arrow, but I'm 99% positive it will run. That plugin will work perfectly fine and work great with the Arrow. Um, when I did my review on YouTube of this mic, if you go into YouTube and just look for George the Tech Townsend Sphere mic review, you'll find it. Um, I did the review with the first Apollo Twin, the original silver one, which is quite a few years old. It's did it perfectly. Sitting in a box over here. It's sitting right in Dan's place. <laughs> um, it worked perfectly fine. And the Arrow Apollo Apollo Arrow is a lot newer. Um, I don't see why, and I don't see why at all you'd have any problem. So, give it a shot. Have fun. Is that the one with is, is that the one that with that the, the, the Tom Machin let us use. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the microphone? Yeah. Or the interface? No, the, the microphone. The microphone, yeah. That's yeah. how I got to do, thanks to Thomas, I got to got to do a review. Right. Because he bought that mic with his own money, and boy, did that sit in my studio for a long time. Yeah. See, and the only, thing, the only thing I thought that was cool about it was the LEDs on it. So. <laughs> it lights up. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of well, it, it, just so you guys know, before we wrap this up, we, that mic um, emulates extremely faithfully 
the sound of tons and tons of other microphones right. from history, including the Sennheiser 416, uh, quite well, um, among many, many other tricks it has up its sleeve. Uh, yeah, definitely wouldn't even think about buying that mic until you've made quite a bit of dough in this business. And unless you have an Apollo, you don't need one, but it, it's really a horribly cumbersome to use without something like the Apollo. And I won't get into why, because we're out of time. Right. But yes, short answer. Yes, Scott. Good. <laughs> All right. I haven't, haven't seen Scott. Of course, we haven't seen anybody in a long time. I know. It's getting kind of weird. I was hoping to see him in Atlanta. He's, that's the kind of place I would have seen Scott for sure. Was yeah. I, I, Atlanta. I actually did a home install this weekend, though. So I did get the chance to actually get out. But, you know, I am venturing out this week myself for the first time. Yes. For f over three months. Yeah. yeah. I think I might start wearing my flight suit. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know. You know tape up the gloves and yeah i didn't buy the tyvek suit yet but yeah <laughs> anyway all right great questions guys and this is why we're here and this is why we love doing it and uh we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back this is bill ratner and you're enjoying voiceover body shop with dan leonard and george widham vobs.tv what question do we get most often far and away it's how do I even get started in voiceover? And we have a great answer to that question. Take the VOHeroes.com free Getting Started in VO course. You heard right, it's free. And it's available online 24-7 at GettingStartedInVO.com. That's GettingStartedInVO.com. If you've been watching VOBS and thinking that you need to get in gear and start your own voiceover career, this is the course you should start with. You'll learn about the vocal skills you need, the storytelling skills you need, the equipment you need, the business skills you need, and the mindset you need to have, all in one single comprehensive online course taught by VO Heroes David H. Lawrence the 17th. This course won the Backstage Reader's Choice Award four years in a row. And again, there's no charge. It's absolutely free. Want to take it? Of course you do! Getting started in VO.com. That's getting started in VO.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. And thus bringeth to an end another voiceover body shop tech talk. Number 35. In the can. Yes, sir. And, uh, boy, and another good one. 
it's always a pleasure talking to you, sir. And, and get that, too. that information and the synthesis that we have and getting this information out to people. I hope you guys appreciate it. Apparently you do because you keep watching it like 8,000 people a month, which is great. Uh, next week on this show, another great guest. We don't like to tell who, but we'll know in plenty of time. Uh, who are our donors of the week? We'll rattle them off. Harlow Rodriguez, Michael Kearns, Christy Burns, Graham Spicer, Antland Productions, Michelle Blinker, and Christopher Epperson. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. And if you want to contribute either just on a one-time basis or as a small subscription, you can do that right on VOBS.TV. There's a, there's a place you can do that. It's very obvious right on the website. It says donate now. Makes it real easy. Uh, we need to thank our amazing sponsors, uh, guys like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Uh, source Elements. Yes, VOHeroes.com. Uh, VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All righty. And uh, Jeff Holman for a great job in the chat room tonight. Our technical director who just, just keeps it rolling along, Smash Sue Merlino. Thank you so much, Sue. We love you. Thanks for all your help. And Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Uh, yeah. So that's going to do it for us this week. The information's out there. Just if you read all the forums on Facebook, it's going to drive you nuts. Just listen to us every week and contact us if you really want to work with some pros and we'll make it happen for you. In the meantime, really, if it sounds good. It is good. All righty. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Have a great week, everybody. Talk.